Please have a seat. So we're going to talk about local power. We want to, we want to have a little discussion with this very big expert about how fashion can help a city and how, on the other way, a city and its government can help fashion. And so let me just say a few words about you. Probably Madame Chapelle doesn't need lots of um, introduction here. Uh, let me just tell you that I read somewhere that she's called the fairy godmother of fashion. And she just told me she's very proud of being Belgian and yes. to help Flanders fashion. So uh, here we are. Um, Mariette Hotnik, she's a force, but in her uh, native uh, Amsterdam. She comes from the Netherlands, and she is the founder and CEO of HTNK, which is uh, another uh, recruiter firm, an agency for recruiting talent. But also, she's very active. Th that, as she said, this is her day job. But her night job is to foster creativity, and she's very active in a few um, things going on in, in Amsterdam, and mainly um, House of Denim, and then there is something called the red light fashion, right. which probably she will tell us a little bit more about. And then, last but not least, Mr. Charles Landry, coming in from England, who is considered a great authority on the use of imagination and creativity in urban change. So his job is to make cities sustainable and help improving the life in a city with creativity. Um, okay, so let me start with what I would like to become a discussion among you, so I'm going to rest my voice. Uh, and maybe I'll start with Anne, because we are in Antwerp, which we all know in the industry how important it is for fashion and how amazing creative power comes out of here in this academy. And yet, when people mention the cities of fashion, Antwerp is not mentioned immediately. People say New York, Paris, Milan, and London, and I think this is wrong. Don't worry, I'm with you. So, <laughs> what do you think could be done from the city or the city towards fashion to improve this? First of all, I have to contradict you. Good. Because Antwerp is mentioned worldwide mm -hmm. as a city of fashion. I think that uh, the only thing we, we lack is not the knowledge abroad, but it's here in this city. We are not proud enough and we don't show enough that we are proud of what happens in this city. And to keep all this creativity here, you have to be extremely supportive as a population. So already there, a city can do a lot. I mean, I prefer to, to arrive back from abroad in the city and see that we are a fashion city. And I don't like to see I'm supporting KLM Airport. I'm sorry yeah, for you, eh? <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, would like, I would like to see that there is beautiful posters and promoting our, our core of, uh, of creativity here in the city. So, yeah, I miss a lot. And, uh, but on the other hand, I'm also very proud of, of being here and in Belgium because I would not be able to sit in Paris and when I listen to the previous speakers, it's very Parisian, the way they describe the, the attitude of a fashion company. It doesn't, uh, it's not here. Here we are starting with dreams. It's very different. We don't start to think about the product. So our designers, which are independent designers, are starting from a dream. And that's what our uh, academy is so strong in, to, to let them have this freedom of mind. And so after, you have these dreamers and you surround them with technical and creative talents around to make it come true. It's not suffering, it's a lot of joy, it's a lot of fun. So we are not suffering people, we are That's very, very nice happy people and very, very powerful in, the, in, in, in the climbing the mountain and having the joy to reach the top. You know, it's not uh, suffering for us. So, but what about, what about, what, I know you have different activities apart from managing your own company, but what about, what, what do you think should be done as a 
fashion executive for the city of, of Antwerp, Antwerp to put it more on the map and to have these people less humble or less shy about, you know, being part of the bigger picture. You know, we can talk for ages on, on what the city can do. The city does a lot. The city is here, the water is here. It's exactly like uh, our, our deputy told you, the, the Antwerpen uh, on the Strom, it's like uh, the water and the Schelde, it does a lot. It is uh, freedom, it's freedom float of the mind. You know, it's like everything what happens is, is, is here, we can enjoy it, we can uh, adore it. Uh, they just have to find ways to to be proud of it and to to expose it to the world. I mean, yeah, I know, I know, and I, I love this thing about you that you talk from the heart. But um, someone would tell me, what about the business? And so you're a private person, and you have invested yourself, your time, and probably money in it. And yeah. do you think there should be some government in it? Do you think there should be something coming from the political power to help the city and mm. the fashion industry in the city? Mm. I think that the city can do a lot. Uh, they can already arrange a lot of events where people can go to and dress up with what we make to be proud of. Yes, I'm a person of the heart and it's the only reason that I can, can be sustainable during all these years in my business. I need to have it. I need to have an ear to the designers. I need to have to listen to their, to their emotions and to get the best out of the belly to show it because that's what we do. So. The city can 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 uh, hold us and 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 you know make sure that we don't run away. That's the main issue because today that the brand don't run over the companies. Yes, that's what you mean. Company-wise, yeah. we there is a lot of challenges. You know, we are approached many many times with big capitals. Come and we will enjoy uh, Italy, Paris, China, Korea. It doesn't matter where we can go to. But no, we fight. We stay independent. It's it's a choice. It's really a choice. A city also has to make choices. Either we are the city of the harbor. Either we are the city of design. Either we we are the city of fashion, but make choices. It's it's fine. We we don't bring a lot of money to the to the bruto national product of the country. You know, we are small independent uh, businesses, but we bring a white flag, and the white flag is something that the city can use and abuse. Abuse is a little yes. bit a very bad word, but the white flag is that we are. We are just image, you know, we can create the image of the city where all the business, what happens here, if it is photography, if it is harbor, if it is, no matter what it is, can hang on it. We can only create beauty and, and, and a beautiful image in the world or for our city. And the city can take this flag and make a lot out of it if they want. They don't have to support us. We are independent designers. That's the strength. Because if we weren't independent, we wouldn't be able to fight so hard. Because the moment you are subsidized, you sit in a very comfortable chair. We don't want to be in a comfortable chair because being in a comfortable chair is cutting your freedom. So we want to keep free, but we want to feel that we are welcome Challenged. in a city and that the city is carrying us forward and that other businesses can grow from what we You're do. You're certainly a big flag for this city, so it's ah, refreshing to hear. Mm -hmm. um, Mariette, let me go to you and, and I guess you have a take on what Anne just said. Uh, from a different perspective, which is the one of uh, the Netherlands and Amsterdam. So you look for talent during the day and you foster talent at night. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, I think because of the daytime job, having a recruitment agency, you find out that there's a lot of talent uh, we don't nurture. Uh, in Amsterdam, the talent drain is huge. It just We have seven academies of art in Holland. Everyone graduates and then trying to find a job. They just It's not easy to stay in Holland. I don't want to keep them all. It's really the whole world is open. But it really would be really nice to nurture it a bit more. And I also think, and that's quite, well, that's quite a statement, I don't think Amsterdam or Holland is ever going to be a fashion city or country. Because the thing is that we have, from Paris, Antwerp, to Milan, to wherever, there are much more bigger capitals than that. But we have a unique proposition, which is like, we have 
the most denim brands worldwide. The denim density of companies in and around Amsterdam is the biggest one in the world, which is really crazy because we don't have production and we didn't have education. So it's like the brands who are there are already there for a long time, looking for talent, having to go abroad. So we thought, and this is what I'm doing at the night time together with a partner, James Vainoff. He was the former director of Amsterdam Fashion Week. He said, that's really strange. We present all these things, but we have a huge business and they're not coming to the Fashion Week. And we should connect these things. And that's basically what we did. So we made a foundation, House of Denim. This is a bigger goal than our own companies. This is like connecting the denim world on denim, sustainability and innovation. And the first thing we started was a jean school, which is the first school in the world educating students on every aspect of the denim business, from plant to pant, basically. And this is totally new in the world. And the denim industry was so surprised. They were like, oh, this is not rocket science. Why didn't we ever think about establishing a school? But oh, no, I have to interrupt you here because maybe I'm the only one who's not clear about this. You said we have no production. So no. what's this denim industry? I mean, you buy the denim from no, abroad and you have the design. The Tell thing me is that what we have in Amsterdam are the global headquarters of big companies and small companies. Okay. So design is there, development is there, but everything is produced abroad. Okay. And to find the people to work in these companies, that's our daytime job. And I'm not only working in Amsterdam, I'm also working in China and in Turkey and everywhere. But the thing is that there were no people educated on the biggest industry we have which is jeans. Everyone is wearing it all over the world and there were new people educated in it. Of course, academies of art do projects on denim and technical schools have like these small courses on it, but there was no school which is totally dedicated to the biggest business. So you literally opened the school? Yeah. And the school is private? No. It's a government, uh, okay. uh, it's a government school. House of Denim collaborated with the ROC in Amsterdam, which is a school. Uh, already and uh, they were educating students on fashion and now this is like their specializations it's three-year course and we had the first graduates this year they do internships everywhere around the world so they're connected to mills factories to the whole uh, process and uh, they work at brands and uh, so they're designer or they they're all designer categories. and product developer okay. because I believe that as a designer you also have to be able to develop a product to understand what's going on, then you're going to be the best designer, for sure. So do you have students from all over the world? Are you able to, you know, make yeah. it known worldwide and have people yes. coming to Amsterdam for we this? We have a lot of demands from all over the world because they, they're so interested in what's going on there. They want to open up their own schools in Brazil, in Morocco, for example, in Turkey, in China. Uh, and we also have international students coming over to Amsterdam and that's for a shorter course. So the three-year course is for Dutch students. So you've got the first year of graduate that now yeah. are going out and yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. And we opened up because we thought, okay, if we have all this, uh, why don't we open up a denim innovation campus in Amsterdam? and get this all together. So we have an atelier, we have a denim archive, which is the first archive in the world, which is not private owned, but owned by the House of Denim. And we have a lab, we have a denim eco laundry, and it's all in the city center of Amsterdam. So brands and designers are able to do their development around the corner, which is local and connected and that's about it's local power i think but what yeah. about so what about the red red light fashion i mean yeah. i read something about that and i was very i thought it was very interesting how it happened because of your office being in the red light in district the red light so district. so yeah. what is it what what do you do there it was a great opportunity because my office of HTNK is in the red light district and the city wanted to do something about the red light district. They bought together with the housing corporation 16 buildings which are in my street. They're former brothels, they were brothels till that, till that moment. And um, they said, we don't know what to do with it. 
right now because the policy of the area was not ready yet. So I told them, who are you going to be having in these houses? And they said, yeah, students or whatever. And I said, well, we have great designers in Holland who are always looking for affordable uh, places to live and work. And if they can use these windows as shop windows, that would be really great. And I thought they were never going to come back, but they did. They talked to the mayor, deputy mayor. They said, okay, and then three weeks later, we had this project, which is Red Light Fashion. It was supposed to be for a year. And it was also there to prove to a city that fashion and fashion designers are important to a city and that they're open to do something which is new. But it's also about, because the city thought these designers are quite well known. Some of them make dresses for our queen. And uh, <laughs> so they said, well, why do they need this? I said, well, success and a bank account is not the same. Everyone is always looking for affordable places. And I think it's also important for a city to support this. So if you say about subsidizing, I totally get it because you have a company. And on the other end, if you're a startup, and you're young, if the city can do something which they would otherwise give to students of any other thing, but help to support young creative talent in the city, that's great. That's very good. The project lasted for four years. Some designers are still living there. Um, the so do they still... work in the windows? No, well, they, they had it for four years. Okay. And the policy was that they wanted to center the whole okay. red light district and get this more connected to what it is. So it was a great opportunity to show to the city because we don't have the support in Amsterdam on fashion. Not Different. at all. We don't think it's a business. Amsterdam, it's not Oof. about fashion. So it's yeah. about product know-how and we are about independent designers. It's a very different uh, area. It's a very different area. Very yes. different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting though what both of you do. Mm -hmm. um, I need to give the words to our yeah. yes. men here. Uh, who comes from a different perspective and so I'm very interested first of all to hear about what you think about what you heard and also What do you do exactly? How do you help cities becoming better places for creativity? Well in relate, I mean I agree with many of the points you've made, but perhaps just to pick up the point why is there even the question about whether places are creative as a totality? And I'm always interested in the total ecosystem of a city. And the whole notion of a creative city is really about how do you create the conditions for people to think, plan and act with imagination. And so what you're really saying from a city perspective is are they enabling this as distinct from controlling mm. it? And if you were to say, what are the measures, how can you look at uh, the creative pulse of a city? There are probably four big clusters of areas. The first is the process of identifying and nurturing talent good. The first point there is how open is the city? You have to be relatively open because this talent might not look like talent. It might be an odd person here or there. So you have to be open, participative in some way. And then the learning landscape needs to be quite sophisticated. It's not only formal, but informal. So let's say that's one cluster of things. The second thing is how does the regulations incentives regime work? Because whether we like it or not, states, cities, there's stuff going on, laws, yeah, rules, incentives. And is that a sort of environment that's saying more yes or more no? Is it more saying, oh, we don't mind a maverick. Oh, we like a maverick. A maverick might become the mainstream and so mm. on. So it's the things like that, and you know about that sort of stuff, but that's also about a city being strategically agile, understanding, and we have to remember that these sectors we're talking about, 30 years ago people thought this was fluff. And the reason why what I'm saying might sound a bit boring, but the reason, the first thing, that happened in the mid 80s and we were involved in that is actually to build the evidence which sounds utterly dull exactly. but what you had to show is that the fragments let's say what you two do what a dancer does a graphic designer a sound so a musician does actually it connects mm -hmm. and once you see it as a totality as the industries of the imagination if you wish mm -hmm. you suddenly see it's more important now there's the tangible side to that jobs if you like and so on but what's really important, picking up Anne's point, 
It's the spin-off, the resonance, perception, image, all of these sort of things that are invisible. Mm. And the key thing strategically for a city to understand is the invisible matters, exactly. the invisible counts, mm -hmm. the intangible counts. And that, unfortunately, because politicians and others always want something tangible. They want this chair, yes, sure. they want this building, they want that. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the main tasks to do that. And I think in general, I mean, you talked about the port activity, mm. could be in other cities the same, is actually there are often more links one could make with the apparently disconnected. Mm. The cities that are most successful don't live in islands of themselves. They're, they have their critical mass in a sector and so on. The are they connected to, to the do. outside world? Sorry? They connected to the outside world. Well, that's the third They're thing that a city them. needs to do in order to harness and exploit what yeah. it has, it needs to internally connect and network and all of that. And again, if there's investment, a lot of that about networking, again, invisible. It might be better to spend a million euros on that invisible than one bit of bricks and mortar. But, but let, me, let me stop you here also, because I know you do some work for the city of Antwerp, and maybe you can give us some example on this, but how do you explain that invisible to a politician who, or to a governor who is probably you, is your boss or your client, whatever you want to call it. How do you make them spend one million in that thing that it's so important if they don't understand it? Uh, well, crisis is often very helpful. <laughs> and the creative use of crisis can be very useful. And ambition is another thing. So crisis, ambition are two things. So you can usually, a politician particularly, you can sort of give them a sense of a picture that is a future picture. And what I tend to do is say, if you don't, what is the cost of not? For 35 years, people like me, that's why I've got grey hair, have been saying, what is the value of creativity, design, fashion, and so on? I say now, what's the cost of you not investing in that? And that's an incredible li uh, liberation. And if they can answer that question, which is difficult, they will begin to understand that the sectors we're talking about are incredibly important. So for me, any of you who have problems with your cities, just say, what's the cost of you not investing in us? That's very interesting because I've worked in an intangible Sci oops, science all my life, like communication, how can you prove yeah. it before it's done? And, and my problem was always telling my bosses, just give me the money now to do it, and I promise you, you will have results in two years, but it it's a little work. bit the same. It doesn't work like that. You have to prove creativity exactly. before you get the support. But and it's okay. But do you believe it's okay? It should be like that. Yeah, these things work it in parallel. Like I mean, the big word for me is orchestration. Exactly. Clearly, you want to do your thing, and you're yeah. doing your thing. Mm. But in a sense, you are communicating with these other people. And oh, orchestration is, and developing critical mass and centrality, these are the sort of key words yeah. that it's about. So centrality for Antwerp will be different than for, for Amsterdam, as we've just heard. But being, I mean, like this fashion talk is a version of centrality. You're not going to copy Paris, but you're going to do your own versions mm, of, of that. Course. But so can you tell us a little bit more about what um, Philip uh, announced that you're doing for, you know, bringing creativity to the city of Antwerp? Well, I don't know if I can do anything really, but um, I'm just, there's this year of um, born in Antwerp and what really, and this is really an issue for secondary cities as a whole, yeah? So there's one thing saying it's born in Antwerp, an idea, or in Amsterdam, or in Frankfurt, or whatever. The question is, how do you make it sustainable through time? Mm -hmm. And the difficulty for an Antwerp, and it could be another city as well, a Copenhagen, is you invest in the key catalyst, which is education. They all become good, and the value added then escapes to Paris and London, to the vortex cities. And there are about six or eight vortex cities in the world that like a maelstrom, suck stuff in. Mm. But you, Belgium, Flanders, have paid for all of that. Yeah. Now, the thing that I'm thinking about, and I haven't got the answer because this is day one of this project, mm. is how can the, 
value added that slips out, and this could be any secondary city, how can you retain it in some way That's in a place like Antwerp? Well, it's a little bit the same thing in companies, actually. You know, some companies, they, they nurture talent. They're like incubator of talent, and then they're small, and then people go away to companies that can pay more, etc. So, do you have the same problem? Do you... I mean, how it can be solved. Okay, <laughs> so it's, it can be solved, but it has to be solved in a very smart way. So when, when I look to myself uh, like two days ago, I was talking on a kind of similar forum in China, and it was uh, concerning Shanghai, Beijing, and Xiamen. Uh, about the fashion and how to, uh, to find talent. So what they uh, are looking for is talent. What we are looking for is production sites, because in this country, our fashion industry is only uh, oriented on the creativity bulb. So we are very creative, but we cannot produce in our own country due to other reasons. So in those countries, they don't have the talent. So what we could do, and there uh, a kind of, of city approach or a global uh, mind of the country could help, is that we could exchange, or f exchange forces, but profit both of it. So it can happen with America, it can happen with Asia, it can happen with many other continents, but even on, on a global part, we are talking here local creativity support, but as we have part of the industry missing, we need to have partners. We need to, to realize that we invest in talent, we invest in the school, we give them all the education, but we want to keep them also in a way in the, in the heart of Antwerp. So why not finding people which we can talk to over the world, not only photographers locally, but over the world who have these production facilities, but still keep it Keeping as born here. in Antwerp, but produce it somewhere else under a sustainable process control. So that can happen. So these discussions we do, I did two days ago, we do it today. It is possible, but we have, we have to open our mind, know what our strength is in this country or in this uh, city, definitely, it is uh, nurturing talent, it is helping talent to develop, it is helping to, to, to grow this free mind into a kind of beautiful uh, uh, shape, and then to help them somewhere else to, to fulfill the, the total business uh, package. It's a, it's so a process it is of all on the go. Every country is talking about it. We are all trying to see who has what strength and where can we help each other. It's like communicating the water. I don't know this word in English. I'm sorry. I don't know really how it. it, it it's like in chemistry, you know that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Communicating the water. So that is That's what good. we have. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> That's what we have to find. Where is our strength to keep it here? To to really be proud of it, and then to find our partners who can give us something else, and we can give them something yeah. else. And then I think we can be very sustainable on a long term with being secure that our academy is not only, only producing babies with a lot of uh, energy, but also to keep the babies happy and healthy for a long time. And that is what we have to do in this city. And there very we good. can do a lot. We can protect the academy, we can protect the talent, we can protect our industry, which is actually a half horse. So, but that's what has to happen. Absolutely. In my agree. mind. What, huh? what, what do you think, Maria? Is the same thing for Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. How do you perceive this? I think, yeah, it, there are so many similarities on a different subject. Yeah. Which but you I also really say like. that you it's lose a, talent, that it goes away. Yeah. And on the other end, because we try to get all these activities to come to Amsterdam, so we got Kingpin Show, which is a denim fabric trade show, to decide for Amsterdam, which is important because at the moment we have a denim fabric trade show in Amsterdam, we have over 500 companies from all over the world coming to the city and checking out if they want to open up there, like a showroom or an office. So you see a lot of business coming to the city, which also needs a lot of talent. And that's what we really like. So we try to make this 
her bigger. And to celebrate this all, because I think we need a lot more celebration in this whole thing. We should be much more proud of what we're doing, we but are. also sharing it to consumers, because we do a lot, B2B, but then you have consumers who are so well educated now, in yes. a way, because True. they have social True. media. They want to know a lot more. So we decided to do Amsterdam Denim Days, which is a week, first days, B2B, uh, trade show, conference, and then it's open to the public. And then you try to convince brands that they have to learn how to communicate with consumers directly which is so much more interesting because we can talk in all these conferences about sustainability, innovation, but in the end there's a consumer who has to understand, ah, okay, if I buy this, that means this. So, and it's a lot about do, see, enjoy. Do fun stuff, learn something, and make this whole environment a bit nicer. I see that everybody wants to say something, but so is it, is it more to help people internally understand the power that you have to make things happen or more to attract interest from other cities, other countries? Both and. Both. I mean, you, you have to do, th to do this, that's why I said orchestration, you have to do many things simultaneously. But I think, like, both of those, but I think the, the interesting point is many of the ways we talk about, I'm looking at it from a city perspective, talk about things incredibly old fashioned and traditional. And so for example, a city should really be asking, how do I generate belonging, a sense of belonging to anyone who comes here? Mm. And in a sense, if I was really advising people, I'd say, give me the strategy for people to fall in love with your place. And that's what it's really about, that you can then move around, but you're still loving somewhere, which yeah. means you give back exactly. in some way through that life cycle. Um, but normally, when we're talking about city strategy, it's all very stuff. What's the so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? What's the mobility plan? Whereas more this emotional stuff, which really drives the success and failure. So it's a lot about psychology, emotions, it all of that. <laughs> So we're going back to the emotion thing. I think we have 30 seconds, but... Um, you have the 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, I know that You're I Belgian. wanted to say you something, so seconds. maybe <laughs> I let you give us a word of conclusion. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, maybe share, I was walking all on the panels in the back, and one of the panels struck me, and that was uh, an initiative who, who is there, visible for everybody, it's called Duke. And that is, I'm like, yes, that's new. Be careful with sustainability that you're not going uh, in the trap of nostalgia. So that is not looking forward. In fashion, in creative minds, we have to spin fast forward and not fast backwards. Thank you very so much. That's I couldn't agree all. more. Thank you.